Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He's the most outspoken university president in the nation. His law school deanship produced one of the very best law schools in the country. He's magna cum laude, Harvard Law Review, clerk to Chief Justice Warren Berger. He's a theologian with a Ph.D. in American religion. He's chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and he teaches three courses a year. He's John Sexton, the president of NYU, and a personal role model and an old friend. It is truly a delight and honor to have you here. Well, it's great to see you, Doug. It is remarkable how we end up in funny places through such circuitous routes. Before we venture into the modern and future university, I need to do something personal because, uh, audience, John was a big brother to me. My dad died when I was 15. I was a freshman at Archbishop Malloy High School. John was the debate coach at St. Brendan's, a girls' school in Brooklyn. I joined the debate team, and then John just took all of us under his wing. And I, I read, first read Camus because of John. We went to see the Boston Symphony Orchestra, saw live concert music. Quick story, we drive up, he tells the guy we're going in these little, these little huts almost, that we have six kids, or eight kids, we're driving up with two dozen. The guy knows it, John knows it, but he dro you drove, Ralph Nader would have been nuts, he drives with his knee, he can read, he's eating steak on the West Side Highway driving, so those, those are some of the personal things. I was, we went through college together, you were a master's student, I was an undergraduate student, Jed was born, and then we hadn't seen each other in a long time until a Knicks game where uh, Van Gundy's holding Alonzo Mourning's leg, but I read these essays because I'm, I'm an NYU alumnus, and I, I got to the website. And I was fascinated with the two websites, uh, the two essays on the website, and now the third one that you sent to me. Let's talk about the university. You've talked about the common enterprise university and the teaching mission. And in some ways, you offer some very controversial stuff about tenure, academic freedom. What is this common enterprise university? Well, there's a way in which the Common Enterprise University is illustrated by the, the essays. Uh, I, I call them reflections. And uh, over the three years that I've been president, I've now uh, done seven of these reflections. And, and they're not picture postcards, as you know. They're 40 to 60 pages. No, they're serious pieces the, the, of academic uh, work. But, but the way they illustrate the Common Enterprise uh, University is this. They're, they're not statements by a president ex cathedra. They're, they're, they're designed to press a community-wide conversation about the nature of the university. So they've been on the role of faculty, on undergraduate education, graduate education, the university in the global time, how you have a conversation in the sanctuary of the university, how the university uh, uh, fulfills its role to teach society to deal with nuance and complexity. And they're, they're first statements, and I put them out. Take the one on the role of faculty in the Common Enterprise yes, University. Yes, please. So, so uh, I put that out for the first time about two years ago. Generated uh, some interest. I yeah, would it say. generated a lot of interest, uh, and, and not only in our community, but this process of doing reflections, interestingly enough, has had me literally invited to talk around the world on different uh, aspects of the university. But I put it out, and, and then it's part of a set piece, all of which illustrates the Common Enterprise University. So uh, I have weekly dinners with students, any student in the university. You know, we, we're the largest private university in the world. So there are 40,000 students. A lot of dinners. Yeah. You have well, to live no, so, so any, well pissed any, any student wants, goes into a lottery, and each week 40 of them, I alternate between graduates and undergraduate students, 
have dinner with the president, open agenda. They're given the reflections. If they want to talk about them, they talk about them. If they want to give a suggestion for improving the university, they're allowed one suggestion because they have to prioritize. We discuss the... You take heat? Well, not, it's interesting. Not so much in the dinners. The dinners are in, civil. Are, are in the presidential apartment, even though they're told to come casual, and even though I dress in a Brooklyn Prep oh, sweatshirt. Please. I know. The, the I students, know. The students, some of them come in jacket and tie. But then I complement the dinners with town halls with the students. So now in the town halls, the, uh, the, the, uh, in the front row, I have my, my, my coterie. They would, they would hate to be called my coterie. But there's a coterie of 10 to 20 uh, you know, activists that are regulars, every town hall. And they, they know the rules. The other students, because I do them in the dorms, and the other students kind of show up. You know, it's their first time. They're, they're little days. They don't know that I'm there to handle anything, that they don't have to stand on ceremony. The activists are in the front row, so their hands go up, you know, with the issue du jour, you know, and led by this wonderful former student of mine who's been the president of the Young Socialist Society since I taught her as a freshman. Her name is Elizabeth Wrigley Field, and she's not a baseball fan. That's the amazing thing. Can you imagine having that? And, and, and Elizabeth is there, and she's got her folks, and they ask me, whatever the issue du jour is, you know, killer coke. Uh, the war in Iraq. You know, m one of my favorite pictures is a picture of Elizabeth walking through Washington Square Park about two years ago, carrying a sign that says "Regime Change at NYU, not in Iraq." <laughs> but but they, they the activists are at the town hall, and then I have Saturday sessions with faculty. Any faculty member that wants can express an interest in being in a group of eight or ten with the president, two-hour conversation, no agenda. I set aside one or two sad days a, a, a month, and I do three or four of those sessions. So I see 40, 30 faculty members, and then, of course, I talk to the elected representatives, and all that's an input device into these reflections. Okay, let's talk about some outputs and outcomes. What comes out of this? Have you found that there is more conversation in just a, 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 a talking sense? Is there more academic interaction? Because we at Baruch are going through a strategic planning process, and we're dealing with the same issues. What's your, been your experience? There, there, there's no question about it that you have to go through a period where people come to understand that the university really is listening. There's a lot of skepticism about that. And I, and I have to say, we're not, we're not there fully. I mean, the, the, the concentric circles are growing. As uh, are ours at Baruch, you, you know, for example. Where, where, where people understand in larger and larger numbers that uh, th this is really an iterative process. You know, somebody said to me about the reflections, now there are seven. Are you going to put them in a book? I said, of course not. I said, a book is final. I said, this is a process that will go on long after I'm president. Maybe my successors will plan different uh, uh, subjects, sure. you know, or change the agenda. Right. But, but One would expect so. But so, for example, on the, uh, on, on, on the reflection, the first reflection that went out, which was on the role of faculty. Let's talk a, about a, that. A, a year, a, a, after a year of conversation, I put out a revised version. Right. The, okay. Let's look at the revised version. You're talking about a different type of faculty. In the university. A different blend. Different blend. And you're talking about different statuses, if you will, particularly tenure. And you're talking about academic freedom. Let's take those three things. Let's take the new faculty, what this new university looks like. Then we want to see, in fact, what academic freedom means here and what tenure means. So let me, let me presume on a 40-year friendship here by... By 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 uh, redirecting the response. By, no, no. By 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 noting how you have framed the issue in an infelicitous way. Oh. So 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 oh. this was this is this is what limited your career as an Archbishop Malloy debate. Oh. So, so, they, they, so they, 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 let's go back. Uh, Wait, you we, see, we if, won the national Catholic debate championships because of you. The the, the, the that was. I won't say it was because of me. It was because of your talent. Oh, your talent, and, and Let's more, go. more than that, the talent of your partner and his ability to carry you. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Thank you. The, 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 okay. So, so, uh, I, I think if one begins the conversation by talking about status and particularly a one-off definition of what status is, which is tenure, one has predetermined the answer to the question, because if you if you come in through that lens, then immediately what you've done is you've created first and second class citizens. And, and I'm trying to reframe the, no, the I conversation. No, I agree. I understand so, that. So, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is, um, uh, is it 
rational for a person, depending upon what he or she wants to do, in a society that is adept at shaming and honoring. And, I, and I, it's very important to introduce the concepts of shaming and honoring. Uh, is it possible to create a world in which a person might choose a different kind of faculty status from that which we associate with the elite research university, to wit, tenure? And I think the answer to that can be yes, and I'm trying to create such a world. Yep. Now, I want to emphasize, this is not an attack on tenure. This is not an attempt to reduce the number of you know, tenured faculty at a university like NYU. In fact, we've just announced a program at NYU which is unprecedented in higher education. We, thanks to six benefactors, we call the partners, who get, who've created a fund of $200 million for us and made it available over a five-year period, we're going to be expanding the size of our Faculty of Arts and Sciences by 20% over the, over the next five years, assuming we can find A-plus people. If not, the departments won't lose the money. They'll still continue to search for A-plus nice people. to have I those mean, resources. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And, and, and those are all tenured and tenure-track positions. So I want to emphasize, this is not about attempting to reduce the, 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 the number of tenured or tenure track faculty. It you're is. You're reimagining what tenure is. No, not at no? all. I'm, what re, you I'm reimagining what a faculty is to, to, to uh, using the devices of shame and honor to deploy the faculty in a much more potent way. Let me give you some examples. I'll, Go ahead. I'll, I'll start Be with, specific. I'll start with easy ones, okay? So we're in New York City. Now, now uh, NYU was founded by Albert Gallatin to be, quote, in and of the city, close quote. Today, we reconceptualize that as NYU's locational endowment. When, when I talk to my friend Larry Summers, uh, or I, I, I say to him, you've got the largest dollar endowment in the world, but I've got the largest locational endowment in the world. And, you know, I can get dollars over time. You can't move. Okay. So, so this, th this is a comparative yes, advantage for NYU that I say, if we embrace the laboratory of New York City. Okay. So one of the assets of a locational endowment is an extraordinary possibility to get part-time faculty into the teaching mix. We, we, we call these people adjuncts. But don't think of them as the, you know, like I was an itinerant adjunct trying to cobble together an income right. when I was the chairman of the religion department at St. Francis College. I taught at Fordham, I taught at St. John's, and so forth. Think instead of Martin Lipton, the leading uh, corporate lawyer in the world, or Spike Lee, okay? And, and these people have in them a yearning to be in the classroom with students as well. So you bring them in. Now, the fact that they don't have tenure doesn't make them feel diminished, believe me, right. when they walk in right. the door. Okay. Right. All right, that's category number one. Category number two, a category that we created at NYU Law School, the global professor. Okay, so you take Hishashi Awada. Hishashi Awada is, is, is the father of the crown princess of Japan. He is Japan's leading uh, legal scholar. After he was appointed as a global faculty member at NYU Law School, not because of it, he was appointed as Japan's representative to the International Court of Justice, the Supreme Court of the world. All right. Now, Hashashi Iwata joined our faculty as a global faculty member, meaning that each year he comes to NYU Law School to teach a course on international law, uh, but he does it for seven weeks. It didn't require him to leave Todai. Okay. The, uh, so also, Robert Battenter of France comes, or, or Alec Bahrain, uh, who wrote the Truth and Reconciliation Report with Desmond Tutu in South Africa, comes. These people do not feel diminished because they don't have okay, we'll the one-off status thing I'm telling you. Now you come to uh, a group of people I call the master teachers. Okay, these are now indigenous faculty. They're full-time. They're there. I will tell you that leaders, the president the former president of one of the great liberal arts universities in the world, a PhD in philosophy, the only man to win the Pulitzer Prize for both volumes of the same biography. People of that caliber have chosen to be master teachers when they could have qualified for tenure. Why? Because they're at a moment in their life where the blend of things they want to do is more heavily weighted towards being in the classroom, being available for students. And they want to be honored for that instead of taking on the responsibilities 
that are supposed to go with tenure. Right. What we ought to start doing is shaming the tenured professors who aren't doing serious research and, and teaching and Get honoring people like, so this is, this Those is what the, who do both, we're happy with this. Th that's right. And, 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 and the people that set up a false dichotomy between being a leading thinker about tomorrow's knowledge on the one hand and teaching on the other, don't get it. Because the best teachers can frequently be the people that are doing the best creative. And then thinking. you've got this other class of people who are the tenured professors. That's and right. these tenured professors and, and the, are whom? And they, the tenured professors are the people who embody both of those aspects, blended the way the particular research university wants them to be blended, in the case of NYU. But the research is paramount. It's oh, prima sinta I, 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 the, the, the research is what defines the research university. So it's a the, sine qua non. It's that's necessary, right. The, the, but not yeah, but it, it's necessary. Okay. But but there has to be a commitment to the teaching as well. You have to require both and and not accept the false dichotomy that some people put on the table. But I need tenure because of my status as a researcher to give me the opportunity to study images of the British city in movies when it's not very practical. This, this, is, this is where I make my argument on, on, on tenure, that uh, because a research faculty and those that are concentrating in their lives on the creation of new ideas is charged with challenging the orthodoxy of the day, that is where the protection of tenure is needed. Also, because ideas take time to gestate. Okay. Whereas the teaching fa fa faculty should be included in a robust doctrine of, of, of academic freedom, along with many others that we never associate with But tenure. the tenured faculty member should have the skills and almost the talents of the master teachers. That's your goal for your tenured props, not only I wouldn't the production even, I wouldn't even knowledge. use the word almost. Okay, I, I take back the qualifier. Okay. Let's go to do dogma, orthodoxy, and the threat to the university. Because I want, I want to. You, you've talked about a coliseum culture, a diminution of civic dialogue, and you find it dangerous. You find it threatening to the university, and you find the university is the last best venue for both right. stopping the tide and having a renaissance. Right, right. What's the status here? So look, n not to make too much of, of, of our experience, but we are both framed by this wonderful world of uh, interscholastic debate. So the first thing that we did when we went into a, 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 a debate room was we took, you know, there was a flow chart, oh, literally one of these oh, artists God, flow charts. I love them. And you would draw eight columns, right? And then as the first affirmative spoke, you would outline the speech. And then the first negative would get up and respond to, you know, give the counter this arguments. Is my life and, and, but they would be little arrows, right? That's but the, but then, different colors, that's too. Right. Then the second affirmative would get up and respond to the first negative. And each time someone got up, those arrows would be drawn. And we, we, we called those arrows extending the argument. And, 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 and that meant going to a new level of argu argumentation. Mm -hmm. Now, by contrast, uh, I watched all 40 of the Democratic presidential primary debates. In the, in, you watch really a sick in, person. In, in, the, in, the first, in the first debate, on his core issue, John Edwards said, I didn't vote for NAFTA. I grew up in a mill town, and my father lost his job. In the 40th debate, he said the same three things, and no one had extended the argument. Page 18 of the New York Times halfway through in a 300 word column. There's a report on his meeting with the New York Times editorial board where they asked him the question that the first negative would have asked. Would you repeal NAFTA? He said no. <laughs> I, I mean, so the, I, I wrote an op-ed piece in the LA Times uh, uh, saying that's not debate. Any high school debater in the country knows you have to extend, extend discussion. There is a serious danger in our society that we have become uh, uh, in our public forum, uh, nothing more than, than mannequins with talking points that just talk by each other, and, and that we're, we're not listening, we're not engaging. The university must step forward and model the kind of conversation about complexity and nuance that civil discourse requires in a democracy. Otherwise, democracy is in danger. And by the way, the research university is also going to be in danger because if, if, if seriousness gets marginalized, 
who loses? We do seriousness, Doug. We do right. seriousness. No, I understand. So we do complexity. And we value it. You know, I mean, I and can, we have the hubris to believe it's valuable. That's right. Well, well, listen. The world's problems today are unbelievably complex and nuanced, and we have to figure out devices. And my theory is that we have to start at our universities. We have to figure out devices for. For, for arming our citizens with the ability to have complex conversations. Yeah, and I think you need to create and, uh, and a, to civil, habituate them. a civil religion that incorporates this dialogue in an open way. Well, I think that's an interesting way of putting it, because, you, you, you know, a vast majority of the leadership cohorts at every level in this country have passed through universities. Right. Think about it. I mean, Come you know, on. okay. So what we have to do is put into the DNA of those students as they're going out. We have to habituate them to, to this kind of conversation. Yeah, but that's fine. But we're not what doing does that it. mean? How that, do you do it? Operationalize well, it. Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I, it, there's a, I, I've been playing with this idea, and uh, as I, I mentioned it in the piece on what I call dogmatism and complexity. Right, the, and, which was and, done when you got your honorary doctorate in uh, Leuven. Yeah. Uh, but I, well, I thought it would be appropriate to use the word dogmatism in the context of a ca the oldest Catholic university. Well, and then we, I, we're not even going to talk about dogma and faith. But you okay, go. But, but, go. Okay. So, so, so uh, there, there uh, was a tragedy in a family in the 19th century that was associated with Harvard, and uh, they gave a benefaction to Harvard that lives to this day in its consequences because every kid that graduates from Harvard College has to pass a swim test because this tragedy involved the drowning of their son. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're at the precipice of a similar tragedy in the collapse of civil discourse. So what I'm kind of trying to work with and talking to some of, some of my uh, peers at other universities, presidents at other universities, but I, I'm trying to work with it primarily at NYU, is, is creating the equivalent of that swim test that would make sure that, that if a kid graduates from NYU as an undergraduate, uh, they will have been habituated in, in this uh, kind of engaged civil discourse. What does that mean? It means a lot of co-curricular activity that will demand of them such right. engagement, the same right. way that the Harvard kids have to jump and, in the and, pool. And, and, a, and a diversity that is not imposed, but is in the aggregate of the exposure. That's right. That's right. So I, 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 the first step is to begin to call attention to the problem. Okay, we got, don't, in the last minute, what's the problem? Give us the clarion call. What, what are we facing here? Well, that's us in the university and us in society. Come on. I, I think there is a large scale undervaluation of the importance of thought. And I think one sees it in, in a movement across a whole host of things towards, uh, thinking in terms of short-term consequences only. So, you know, from global warming to social security and medical care, uh, it be, it, we've made it very, very difficult to think on a horizon beyond the next quarterly report. Okay, but at the same time, we've got this, this, this ideologically religious politics where sectional doctrine has invaded That's, the public space. I think I, and, and you have thought long and hard I, about church and state I, and their separation. I, 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 th I think the, the ideologically uh, driven politics is, is a small part of the problem. It's not the whole problem. Oh, sir. I'm more concerned about the heuristic tendency just towards dogmatic, unlistening thinking in society. Ironically, I think that the solution comes from the religious uh, or spiritual dimension because I think for the American people we have to begin to elevate the importance of what I would call the fulfilling values as opposed to the measurable values in life. We become a very metric society, metric principally in terms of dollars. And, and status, this gets back to issues of status again. Right. Status so frequently is determined in our society by the kind of car one drives, the number of homes, what restaurants one goes to, what, and, and, and we've kind of lost the notion, for example, that you and I got early on. We were taught that the highest and most noble calling is the calling to teach. And, and you know, and we draw so much talent you and, and, you know, right. and, and I would say, frankly, that, that good. you and right I on. are happy for that. Yes, reason. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely thrilled. It has been a real pleasure. 
I would love to have this conversation with some frequency. I'd like to sit you and my good friend Matt Goldstein down to talk about Matt some is of a this great stuff. man. I'm he a great fan fabulous. of his. He's fabulous. My president at Baruch. Well, he's your boss, so you have to say that. But no, I'm no, telling, I, I don't I'm have telling to, you, no, he's no, a no, great. You, oh, that's right. You have tenure. That, that, right. <laughs> and on top of that, I'm known to be obnoxious. So, no, I don't well, have to say nice a, things. The, the, but we'll do it. But it's been a real pleasure. Thank great, you. Great to see you, Doug. I'm supposed to meet Annie Hall here in front of the Beekman. And I tell you, she better hurry up because they're tearing this place down at the end of June to put up a hospital, which is not a bad idea because I'm actually feeling pretty nauseous. Oh, yeah. I've been to the Beekman many times, you know. It's quite famous. As the film historian Jerry Carlson points out, the Beekman is a fine example of Art Deco architecture. And it was a burlesque house in 1920. It was the first theater to show Weekend at Bernie's with French subtitles. Listen to this pompous jerk trying to impress his girlfriend. Hey, what's it to you? You've totally misrepresented what Jerry Carlson said. I know what I'm talking about. I teach a course in film architecture at NYU. Oh, yeah? Well, as it happens, I just happen to have Professor Carlson right here, the host of CUNY TV's City Cinematheque. Go ahead, tell him. You know, I've been listening to what you've said, and I have to say, you know nothing about this theater. The Beekman, in fact, was built in 1952, and its tilted glass facade is a classic example of streamlined art modern design. Boy, wouldn't it be great if life were really like this? Not only is the Beekman just a stardust memory, by the end of the year, they'll be tearing down the last remnant of old Times Square. Howard Johnson's is going to be gone. I mean, where am I going to take my rabbi for tender sweet clams? Gee, what's happening to my classic New York landmarks? The Plaza Hotel. I mean, it's going condo. They closed it for a two-year renovation. Used to have 800 hotel rooms, more than that. When it reopens, it'll have just 350 hotel rooms. I mean, that's not even enough for J-Lo's entourage. Listen, don't mourn too long the landmarks of your youth. What's great about New York is it's always building something new. Well, except for the West Side Stadium. Have a great summer. Barry Mitchell for City Talk.